the anti-slavery movement, um, which, you know, I think is one of this country's most powerful mass movements in, in our history. Um, I mean, generally, what do you think the left can kind of learn today from that? Obviously, a very different time period, different movement, but just like the way that movement had an impact on U.S. politics. What can we kind of take from that today? Oh, I, I think it's an... Uh... This is a lesson I've come to very slowly over, after years of studying it, and, and basically has to do with coalition building. Right? The, it is, it's notorious, it's famous, it's, it's accepted by all historians that the Republican Party in the 1850s was a kind of unwieldy coalition between diverse, often contradictory elements, and yet it succeeds. And, and I think watching how you build that kind of coalition among people who might disagree about a lot of other things, disagree about internal improvements, disagree about immigration, disagree about all sorts of things. If you can find a way of marshalling an underlying anti-slavery animus and tacking it to a particular policy, in this case, preventing slavery from expanding into the Western territories. It's possible to build out of these discordant elements a, a viable political coalition. But but it's beyond that. It's beyond that because, because even a political coalition like that, once you get to civil war, right, they need to go beyond uh, a Republican Party coalition. So the Lincoln and the Republicans are quite conscious that they're going to have to get the votes of war Democrats, right, who may be hostile to emancipation, but will stay with it if they can be persuaded, say, that this is a war primarily to, to restore the Union, and we're willing to swallow ultimately the Emancipation Proclamation and even the 13th Amendment, if, as long as we restore the Union. So you find another way of holding that coalition together. And it goes beyond that, too, because the, the coalition, the, the political coalitions have to be sustained by larger social coalitions. So that Republican coalition comes to rely on a number of populations that are outside of formal politics. Large numbers of women, for example, uh, contribute to the, to the war effort in a variety of different ways. For example, the Republicans place a great deal of faith and hope uh, uh, in the non-slaveholders of the South. Right? They are initially very reluctant to secede. There are enough non-slaveholders in, in the northern, in the upper south to prevent those states from joining the Confederacy, which is a devastating blow to the Confederacy right from the start. They, they just assumed that every slave state would join them, but the slaveholders in those states cannot get the non-slaveholders on board. There's a good deal of evidence that they were reluctant secessionists. So we know that over the course of the war, they were the first to abandon the Confederacy. And by the last year of the war, they are they are massive defections from the Confederate Army from those. But the biggest, most important group outside of formal politics that becomes part of the tacit Republican coalition are the slaves themselves. It becomes very clear from the very earliest weeks of the war that, that the slaves understood this war to be about their own freedom, their own emancipation. And by the end of the first year of the war, Republicans are saying uh, very clearly, in based on letters coming back to their families from the South, from soldiers in the South, from from uh, 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 Union officials in the South, writing to Washington officials, the only reliably loyal people we we are encountering in the South are the slave population, and in formal political terms, loyalty begets an obligation to protect on the part of of the state and 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 to a large extent it's the loyalty versus disloyalty issue that is always determining the fate of emancipation and it became very clear very early on that the slaves were an indispensable loyal part of the loyal of the coalition of the loyal and so so when you listen to republicans like william seward talk about this coalition they say this is a fight between slaveholders and non-slaveholders. And the non-slaveholders include all of those people I mentioned. It includes the slaves. It includes women. It includes Democrats. It includes, it includes, you know, everybody inside and outside the coalition. So that's the lesson I took from it that, that don't be so picky about the ideological purity of the people inside your coalition 
just keep your eye on the prize. Know what it is that this is all about. This is fundamentally about uh, uh, about the, the slavery and the destruction of slavery and do what you need to do to keep that coalition together. Because if you can't do that, you're not going to get anything. I want to follow up on that by asking one pretty basic question about the anti-slavery movement, which is, how big was it? Because I think that, you know, sometimes in the popular imaginary, there's this idea that the abolitionists were like a pretty small kind of moral vanguard. Um, But I think something that's interesting about what you just said and and about your writing in general is that you make it clear that this is a mass movement um, and that, you know, took many years of uh, kind of different groups, uh, not just coming together, but actively, as you were saying, (laughs) doing politics together. Um, and as you, as you just said, like the coalition was at times fragile. Um, so how, so first of all, how big was it? And then the other question I have, uh, just following from your point about kind of maybe throwing ideological purity, like by the wayside at sometimes, um, something you've written about for Jacobin before is this idea that we see coming from some quarters of the left that like, well, white abolitionists were actually just racist anyway, or like, you know, this idea that like, well, Abraham Lincoln, like, sure, the Emancipation Proclamation, but like secretly or like deep down, he was a racist. Uh, how, how do we make sense of that charge? I, I don't find well, it satisfying. It's, but- uh, it's, <laughs> it's completely unsatisfying because it's based in an, in an idealist conception of history that fails to step back and look at the structural situation that people were in. So you have a situation, uh, let's take the Mississippi Valley during the Civil War, where some of the most violent versions of emancipation are taking place. These are huge plantation districts that are overrun by Union forces relatively early in the war. And what you see is a a very violent process, often uh, uh, by which the Union army is literally tearing up the slave system in, in this extremely wealthy part of the plantation south. Well, uh, the point is that uh, the Union Army is the revolutionary force, or one of the two major revolutionary forces in conjunction with the slaves themselves in the south. And there is too much focus on the ideological inadequacies of some of the people who are in the Union Army. Right. Some of them are racist. Some of them do nasty things to the people they are in the process of liberating. And there's, it's, it's very important to step back and look at this as a structural transformation that doesn't depend on the ideological uh, orientation of individual soldiers. Let me give you a, a very specific example. Uh, historians of, of emancipation during the Civil War rather like John C. Fremont. This, he was he was a uh, he was the Republican Party candidate in 1856, and he famously declared the emancipation of slaves very early in in Missouri during the Civil War. Uh, uh, but it, it was and he was told by Lincoln to rewrite his order, and then he was fired. Like that he was uh, and he was fired because he was incompetent as a general, right? Mostly because he was just not a competent general. Now, if if you by comparison, you take someone like William uh, Tecumseh Sherman, who, unlike Fremont, doesn't have very strong anti-slavery convictions, is kind of racist, but is a very competent general. Now, if you step back and say the Union Army is the force that is digging up slavery wherever it goes, then what you want to destroy slavery are competent generals. Right. So William Tecumseh Sherman is a much better emancipationist than John C. Fremont ever was because he was totally incompetent as both an emancipationist and a general. Right. So you, you need to step back and see the degree to which that the the, the uh, you know, the quality of an emancipationist does not depend on how they feel about black people. It depends on whether they are participating actively and effectively in the destruction of slavery. And I, I think, you know, that, that, and I think it's, it's that idealism that has taken a hold. I don't want to say it doesn't matter what, what, you know, individual soldiers feel, but you need to step back and accept that it's without a union army and without the successful defeat of the Confederacy on the battlefield, you're not going to get emancipation. There is no emancipation. And it's not as though 
It's not as though it's a normal thing in wars for uh, armies to go around emancipating slaves. It's actually quite the opposite. The normal kind of thing that happens as wars is what the Confederate army did. They go into Pennsylvania and they round up blacks and enslave them. When they take over areas in the Mississippi Valley that had been occupied by the Union forces, they re-enslave massive numbers of, of blacks. That's what armies tend to do throughout human history. They enslave. Why is the Union Army not enslaving? Well, there's a policy coming out of Washington telling them not to, telling them to do the opposite, right? So if you don't step back and look at the, the political, you know, stakes that are, that are being fought out and, and the policies that are coming out of Washington and what the Union Army is actually there to do, then it seems to me, it, 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 if you're going to reduce it to how how nice this individual soldiers feel about black people, you're never gonna you're never gonna understand what's going on. So I, I want to just quickly jump back to the first part of my question, um, which is okay. how big can we say the anti-slavery movement was? And let's not include the Union Army for this. And I know okay. you know it's kind of it's kind of. Um, it's kind of like a, a vague question or, you know, obviously we can't put an exact number on it, but if we look at, you know, groups and uh, anti-slavery publications and, um, you know, whatever else uh, we can define within well, the scope of the movement, I mean, just to get a size, because we were talking about it being a mass movement rather than like a committed vanguard, yes. right? Yeah. Yes, yes exactly. Uh, the Republican Party is an anti-slavery party. And it wins a majority of the votes in the North. So you can say with some certainty that a majority of Northerners by 1860 are, are committed to anti-slavery politics, right? I, you know, the Confederates used to justify secession in part by claiming that and complaining that a whole generation of Northern Northerners were raised on anti-slavery you know, uh, anti-slavery school books. They listen to anti-slavery sermons in their churches. Their parents are anti-slavery. That a whole generation of Northerners had grown up thinking in in pro-slavery in anti-slavery terms. And I think that's basically accurate. I used to have exactly the opposite problem when I was teaching Southern history. I would try to get students to not be so censorious or not assume a kind of moral high ground about Southerners because they had grown up in a world that accepted slavery and that was that the world had accepted slavery for thousands of years right so yes they're on the wrong side but but you know you could have easily been on the wrong side and that's one of the things abraham lincoln used to say if i was born in the south i would probably be pro slavery just like most southerners are but i was born in the, you know I, I wasn't born in the north actually i grew up in the north i accepted the principles of of my northern education my but my parents were anti slavery they went to an anti slavery church so he grew i can't remember a time when i wasn't anti slavery and i think probably the majority of northerners felt the same way you couldn't get you couldn't get a northerner to argue that slavery was a constitutionally protected right of property. Even even the Democrats couldn't bring themselves to say that because they wouldn't get elected. So if, if you think in those terms, this is where Matt Karp and, is right. We're talking about millions of abolitionists, millions of people vote for someone who has explicitly said, I am committed to putting slavery on a course of ultimate extinction. Right? And if you don't take that seriously, you say, oh, but look at the way he planned to do it. It wasn't going to work. It wasn't, you know, you know, all right. You know, <laughs> it's a revolutionary, it's a revolutionary transformation in, in not just U.S. history, but in, in global history. Really. And to go back to uh, William T. Sherman as an abolitionist, I got to say a really funny image just popped in my head of Sherman in a white fragility session with Robin DiAngelo. Um, <laughs> Gave me a pretty good laugh. But, right. I mean, also, and, he's you know, the, yeah, I maybe know, he should have. <laughs> he's he's horrible about slavery and and you know he, there's a there's a notorious incident where during the famous march from atlanta to the sea where a number of of enslaved people run to his lines and one of his commanders pulls up the bridges and they're stuck on the other side of the river and the slaveholders come after them and and do horrible things to them you know and he's he's more or less indifferent to the immediate suffering of those people but he is destroying slavery more effectively 
than almost any union commander, except maybe Grant. Yeah, and, and you know, and what's frustrating about this is, you know, none of what you just said to me is denying any agency to African Americans or enslaved people. And, and like you said, I mean, enslaved people fully understood throughout this whole process that this had to do with them, and they, of course, acted that way. But you know, there's nothing denying agency to say that other groups were being active too. You know what I mean? No. One of the first things I ever published as a young historian, as a young scholar, was a, an, an essay on the political significance of slave resistance. And, and, and all that's happened in the 30, 40 years since I, since I wrote that and published that is, is affirmed my belief in, and deepened my conviction that, that you cannot understand emancipation outside of the agency of the slaves. Moreover, the big surprise to me when I switched from studying slavery to anti-slavery politics was the realization that, that the Republicans understood that as well. But they knew that for emancipation to work, significant numbers of slaves had to run to union lines and undermine the slave system from within. Ultimately, significant numbers of, of enslaved men had to join the union army and become one fifth of the union army by the last year of the war. Right. So the Republicans knew that the agency of the slaves was a central part of the process they were they were embarked on. And this is kind of a good lead into what might be our last question. And you know, as a former history public school teacher, I definitely care about this one. Um, and you, you know, a lot of the right wing attack on the sixteen nineteen project, which to be clear is not the attack you're doing, but from the right wing, a lot of it has now transformed into. How do we teach history in our schools, critical race theory, all these things are kind of melding together. So, I mean, how do you think public schools should teach the history of slavery and civil war in the United States? Teach the conflict. Just don't lose sight of the conflict, really. That's what bothers me about the, the, the Matthew Desmond essay. Um, that's what bothers me about so much of the, the so much of the recent scholarship uh, is that it erases it erases the conflict that's always been there. Without conflict, it's there is no history. History is driven by conflict. Seems to me. I I think I have actually just one more last question, um, kind of maybe to go back to the sort of initial question about the sixteen nineteen project. Um, so I I think you know. Um, Something people obviously find uh, this idea that you can trace a sort of unbroken string from slavery to the oppressions or the inequalities of modern day very compelling, right? And uh, just by way of anecdote, um, a few years ago when we started hearing uh, this, I guess, narrative that modern policing evolved out of slave patrols, I actually wrote to a historian of policing, James. I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna ask you about that too. But I, I wrote to a historian of policing, and you know, I was like, "Can you recommend some reading on this particular question?" Because you know, I, I don't know. I like have questions, and and I'm not really sure like about the veracity of this, right? And the historian, who of course I'm not gonna name here, um, was was very like kind and thoughtful and was basically like, this is a very hard claim to sustain empirically, but I'm reticent to come out swinging against it because people find it so compelling. So AKA what the historians who didn't want to sign the letter to, uh, uh, to the New York Times about the 1619 Project, a, a variation of kind of that sentiment, right? So um, two questions for you. One, did policing evolve out of slave patrols since you are a historian of that time period? And I really would like to finally get an answer on record. Uh, and then B, um, I guess again, because people find that because people find kind of these metaphors or like these linkages so compelling, is there a political utility to I don't know, kind of maybe I don't fudging the facts or <laughs> maybe there's a more diplomatic way of putting it, but well, I'm not a historian of policing, but by my impression has always been let's let's narrow the question down to when do you get police forces because it's like when we talk 
things, when we say things like defund the police, we're talking about defunding more or less urban police forces. And you don't get urban police force. Urban police forces are a function of urbanization, and you don't get much urbanization in slave economies. So you first see it in Boston and Philadelphia and New York and like that. And it's, and it's, it, it's a, it, it's, it's structurally, it has always tended to be a rather reactionary force. It's there to uphold the order as it exists. And if the order is inequitable and unjust, it's going to, police are going to uphold. So a lot of it was originally suppress immigrants, suppress workers, things like that, you know, but, but, but the police forces we live with today have, uh, as far as I know, have their origins there, not in slave patrols. I, you know, I'm the last, I, I, I wrote two books about slavery. I, I take the history of slavery very seriously, but I don't think that we need to go back to slavery to justify policies designed to counteract mass incarceration because mass incarceration doesn't come out of slavery. It comes out of the 1980s and 90s. And it's a, it's, it's, that's where you start to see massive increases in incarceration rates. And it seems to me that, that the, the slavery, you know, on one hand, it has to, it's a truism. Everything in the past produces everything in the future, right? So, yeah, slavery is part of our past. But it seems to me that that the specific problems we face right now have more specific origins. And it's not, it doesn't help me to tie mass incarceration to slavery. It, it's It's more helpful to me to tie it to Clinton and to neoliberalism and to what happened to the Democratic Party and why that has to be dealt with now as a problem, right? And the same with the the massive inequality that has emerged in the United States and reached record levels starting in 1970, you know, starting in the 1970s. That, that, that's a problem we are living with right now. If you want to tie it back to Jim Crow or to slavery, I don't find that particularly helpful because it's the policy reversals that emerged in, starting in the 1960s, the decision not to tax rich people at the levels they had been taxed at, not to tax corporations, not to, you know, a whole series of policies that were implemented that have resulted in this dramatic increase in inequality and economic injustice that is a threat to democracy right now. And, you know, uh, I don't see the, it doesn't help me figure out what needs to be done right now to tell me that its origins are in slavery or racism or something like that, or, or Jim Crow. I just don't see that that's helpful. And it's not because, again, it's not because I'm someone who doesn't care about that history. I, I've devoted my life to that history. It just doesn't seem to me, it just doesn't seem to me to be helpful right now. The kinds of stuff you learn from history are more the more general stuff that I was mentioning earlier. The importance of coalition building, the not worrying too much about the ideological purity of the coalition, so long as the policy is, is clearly understood and what needs to be done. So, you know, the, the, the populists of the late 19th century, of the 1890s, for example, the, the, the Colored Farmers Alliance and the Farmers Alliance threaten the power of the, of the landlord, landlord class that had emerged as very powerful. You know, and the landlord class fights back and destroys so much of the, what had been achieved in Reconstruction and massive disfranchisement that results in the disfranchisement, not simply of most blacks, but of a substantial number of poor whites, because that potential coalition is so threatening to the ruling class that had emerged in the South in the late 19th century. And it doesn't help understand that what was going on to say, but look how racist so many of those colored, those white farmers were. Yeah, they were, but they had interests class interests that could potentially, if they unified, seriously threaten the, the powers that be, the ruling class. And I think those are the kind of lessons we need to care about. Whereas, you know, again, uh, seminars on how to be an anti-racist don't, don't help. They don't help. They, do, they probably do more damage, you know. I can't tell you how many how many people I know, even in my own family, who voted for Trump, who voted for Trump, and have a deep abiding resentment of the coastal elites 
who continually refer to them as racists. And I know, I know these people because they're in my family because they're not racists, that they can't stand being called racists. And the, 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 I, I, I watched, I watched Ted Cruz uh, uh, two days ago, uh, interrogating, uh, a group of witnesses before a congressional committee about uh, whether or not the voter ID laws were racist. And the three Democrats all said they're racist and two others said they weren't racist. And he just skewered the, the, the Democrats because they should have said, no, they're not, they're not explicitly racist. They're part of a Republican party project that goes back decades designed to, to overthrow democracy in a variety of different ways. It's a power grab, right? And he he could get them on the racism charge, but if they turned it around and said, you know, you guys are systematically, you know, reapportioning legislatures so that the Republicans will stay in control and Democrats lose, you're systematically reapportioning congressional districts, you're taking over the judiciary, you're doing everything you can to ensure that your party wins permanently and the Democrats lose. And part of that is voter ID laws and a whole bunch of things that will disproportionately affect blacks but are basically part of a much larger power grab. The racism argument isn't, it, it's, it's not going to work if you see what the Republican Party has been up to for the last 50, 40 years. What, the, what do they think the Federalist Society comes from? I think a lot about how uh, Eric Foner always sort of famously identifies Reconstruction as like a really important time period that the left should study, uh, you know, in terms of like thinking about coalition building as, as you were talking about and also political strategy. Um, so just, you know, again, to kind of, um, uh, I don't know, go back to your comments on coalition building. I just personally find that a much more useful way of recalling history or like finding historical analogs than to just say that, you know, everything can be traced back to slavery or Jim Crow. So. Or racism. Or right, exactly. Or, right. Or a you know, race, a kind of trans historical I mean, to racism go back, or something. To go back to where we, to go back to where we started, uh, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, a, a, a fine historian of early American history named David Waldstreicher, has uh, wrote in his very first book that uh, the American Revolution did not was, did not invent racism. Racism had existed for quite some time. What the American Revolution actually invented was anti-racism, and he's repeating that in a new book that he's about to publish. You know, there is there's a history of anti-racism. When we study the history of racial ideology, we tend to study the racists. We don't study the anti-racists. And and you know, we're we're mostly looking at the anti-racists for the inadequacies of their anti-racism, right? <laughs> but you know, they're not anti-racist the way I think we should be anti-racist. Therefore, they're racist. Well, you know. You have to study that as a part of the history too, because it's there. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.